أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم سبحانك يا رب إنك أنت العظيم الحكيم وعنده مفاتح الغيب لا يعلمها إلا هو ويعلم ما في البر وما تسقط من ورقة إلا يعلمها ولا حبة في ظلمات الأرض ولا رطب ولا يابس إلا في كتاب المبين. So after we discussed the introduction to the major signs with the hadith of Tamim al-Dari رضي الله عنه as is narrated in Sahih Muslim in which the Dajjal discourses with Tamim and he gives him these three signs, these three indicators now we are in this lecture, inshallah, ready to jump into the actual major signs of the end of time. And the first of those that we are going to discuss, inshallah, today is the Mahdi. Now, the things that we're going to discuss in this lecture and in the next lecture, the Mahdi, the Dajjal, and the return of Christ, these three issues are all narrated through Tawatur in our Hadith tradition. So the hadith of the Mahdi, over 30 Sahaba narrated. The hadith of the, the of Christ coming, something like over 60 Sahaba narrated. And because the hadith of the Mahdi and the hadith of the Dajjal, usually they involve the return of Christ because the return of Isa is integral to both of them. Also, the return of Christ is something that is narrated by Tawad. So it's very important that we understand that as from an academic point of view, that this is something that is, is narrated to us in the same way, in the same rigorous way that we receive the Qur'an. And the reason I begin this way is that particularly with the issue of the Mahdi, there have been many people throughout Islamic history who have claimed that they were the Mahdi. Many, many people, maybe, maybe north of 100. Most recently, uh, the whole attack of the Haram in Mecca in the late 1970s, Juhayman and all of that, one of those people claimed that they were the Mahdi. And that's how that whole fitness started. And people claiming that they're the Mahdi actually itself is one of the signs, one of the major signs of Yom Al-Qiyamah. And this was so much the case that around the 9th century, one one of the famous writers that we know of today, Ibn Khaldun, rahimahullah, he actually negated the hadith related to the Mahdi. And because of that, and those that were influenced by him, the ulama of hadith, you know, basically from that time up until now, the current generation, have always sought to respond to those type of claims. So people will say, oh, the, the hadith of the Mahdi, their singular hadith, you know, their ahad hadith. It's, it, it doesn't mean what it means, or it means something else, or it's, it's weak, or it's fake, or it's not something that's integral. So the ulama of hadith, they would come in, what are you talking about? This over, over 30 sahaba narrated the hadith of the Mahdi. That's, that's not tawatur than what is. And as a matter of fact, it is because of this type of mistake, Ibn Khaldun, I mean, no one is perfect. He's a historian. Uh, uh, a sociologist, he's not a scholar of hadith, he shouldn't have said that, he was wrong. But because hadith is so central to Islam, Ibn Khaldun for, for the longest time was essentially unknown. It was really not until Western scholars started paying attention to Ibn Khaldun that he became sort of important and part of the Muqaddimah that he wrote was translated into foreign languages, into English for example, Franz Rosenthal translated parts of it, that he became important. But for the for the inside the academic circles of Islam, he kind of ostracized himself because he attacked the hadith. So people that tend to do that, they do not care about it. Because the hadith is one of the, you know, it's one of the two central pillars of the faith, the so Quran and the hadith text. And it is because of this uh, opinion that exists that from time to time, from generation to generation, you will have people that will, you know, feel uncomfortable about talking about these type of signs of Yom Al-Qiyamah or they'll negate them or they'll try to explain them away or things like that. So I just wanted to begin with that so we have that in, our, in the back of our minds. The point of this lecture is not to debate those issues. I mean, you just have to, we're just going to, 
we, we're going to understand that it's mutawafir, and we're going to talk about what the traditions say. We don't need to get into a hadith today. But I want people to understand that there is that thinking that exists, and that's where it really comes from. Another challenge when we discuss things like the Mahdi is that there oftentimes is confusion with the Shia narrative of the Mahdi and Sufi interpretations of the Mahdi. So we're going to do our best to stick with the old-fashioned Qur'an and Sunnah so we don't get lost between the two of those. Of course, the Shia, they believe that the Mahdi was, is the 12th Imam. And that 12th Imam went hidden. And therefore, they're waiting, Muhammad al Askari, they're waiting for him to come back. So in Shia tradition, the Mahdi is referred to as a Mahdi Muntadr, the awaited Mahdi. And to make things even more confusing, that phrase is used sometimes by Sunni scholars and Mahdi Muntadr. But as I said in the beginning, it is haram for us to wait for the signs of Yom Al-Qiyam. We are not to wait. We don't, we don't sit around and wait for this to happen. Rather, we know it, we pass it on. So when it happens, we say, Sadaqa Rasulullah Sallallahu and we know what we're supposed to do at that time. The Mahdi might not appear during our lifetimes. Might not appear during the lifetime of our children or their children. But it is an obligation that we pass on this information because somebody from our descendants somewhere will be around when all of this stuff happens. And we want them to be on the right side, not on the wrong side. So, and when I say Sunnis use the word Mahdi Muntadr, like Ibn Hajar, he wrote a book called Al Mahdi Muntadr. Our own, the Shaykh of our, our Mashaykh, Shaykh Abdullah bin Siddiq al Ghumari, he himself, he wrote a book about called, and he, he called it Mahdi Muntadr, the awaited Mahdi. I mean, we're awaiting him in the sense that it's one of the signs of Yom Qiyamah, but we're not awaiting that Mahdi the way the Shia are waiting for that particular person in history to come back. And then the Sufi stuff, it, it's, it's just as wacky because all of these things are intuition, inspiration. It could be right, it could be wrong. But we're not going to go wrong when we limit our discussion. Not limit, that's the wrong word. We're not going to go wrong when we base our discussion on the Kitab and the Sunnah. There are many tariqahs, there are many Sufi traditions about the importance of the Mahdi, how the the lineage of the of a specific Sufi order has ended and, and it will last like this until the Mahdi will come and things like we're not concerned with those are internal Sufi discussions. We're not going to base our Sunni understanding, our Orthodox Sunni understanding on that, because that's at the end of the day, with all respect, and I come from that tradition, it's ijtihad. We are going to base our understanding on what we understand from the Kitab and the Sunnah. Okay. In general. What do we believe about the Mahdi? We believe that the Mahdi will appear at a time of great tribulation for the Muslim world. And, you know, we could say that well, we're, we're, how, how worse can things be at the time of this recording in 2020? You know, how worse can things be? Well, you know, God forbid, they could get a lot worse. But remember what I said last lecture and the lecture before about the Khilafah and about the Khilafah ending in 1924, the Ottoman Caliphate ending in 1924. And why that's important for our understanding of the Mahdi. So when we say and we read in the Hadith that the Mahdi will appear at a time of great political tribulation and he will bring the community together, it, things are so bad that only somebody like the Mahdi, which we will describe, can bring things together. Now, we can't do that ourselves. You know, we can't bring together, we can't create a club called the Return of the Khalifa Club and try to bring back the Khalifa. We can't create an organization called, you know, the Muslim organization uh, of, of Khilaf. And I'm trying to be, you know, generic, but, but if you can read between the lines, there are unfortunately since 19, the 1920s till today, organizations and movements with the express goal of bringing back a Khalifa type of situation. And according to the hadith of Hudayf al-Yamani that I've mentioned before that is narrated in Sahih al-Bukhari, when Hudayfa asks, radiallahu anhu, the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa what do we do when there's no khalifa? 
the Prophet said, stay away from all those groups, i.e. those political groups that are going to try to bring back the Khalifa or claim that they are the pure Islamic rule or something like that. In Zamin Iman, stay with your own body politic. If you are a Muslim in a Muslim majority country that has a functioning government, that's your Iman. Even if that Iman is bad and corrupt, because the Prophet said, follow that Iman, even if he strikes your back and steals your wealth. And for those of us that live as minority, our government that we are citizens of is our Imam, that we owe our allegiance to that, the way that the Sahaba owed their allegiance to the Najashi when they lived in Abyssinia as a minority. So when we say that the Imam appears at a time of great political disunity and tribulation and <coughs> fighting, now we understand why the collapse of the Caliphate is one of those introductory signs. Because it is only through the appearance of the Mahdi that this unity will be able to come back. So the Mahdi is a spiritual and political leader of the Muslims. He is and will fulfill the role of the Khalifa politically and spiritually the way that the original Khulafat were after the passing of the Prophet We also understand in our, from the Hadith that he will be somebody that is not just respected amongst the Muslims, but he will be respected internationally. Okay, so again, this is not something that we're forcing down people's throats, but he will be somebody that's recognized and respected. What does that mean? He'll be invited to the, the UN General Assembly. He'll be invited to the European Parliament. He'll be recognized as a leader and he'll be loved and respected. So when he says something, you know, people will be like, oh, you know, we should listen to this guy. This guy makes sense. When he says, uh, I don't know, you know, let's do something about this refugee problem. Then people are going to be like, yeah, you know what, listen to him, we should do something about the refugee problem. Even though we're, we're yellow at the top of our lungs, how about these poor refugees? And no one wants to do anything. But when the Mahdi appears, this is one of the, the, the facets of his, of his character, is that Allah Ta'ala will put the acceptance of the Mahdi in the hearts of, of people. Okay, so this is not something that you can force or you can make up. I can't dress somebody and say, oh, look, this is the Mahdi, and that's not going to work. Where is that legitimacy going to come from? And there will be great wealth that will come from him. So when there is economic uh, difficulties in the Muslim community or the heartland of the Muslim world, and we will read now, he will, he, there will be excess wealth during his time, such that people will be so satiated, they really won't even worry about financial matters. What can, those are sort of just the theme, the high level theme. What can we deduce from the many, many, many dozens and dozens and dozens of hadith about the Mahdi. The first thing is that his name will be Muhammad and his father's name will be Abdullah, matching the name of the Prophet and the name of the Prophet's father Abdullah. So his name will be Muhammad ibn Abdullah and his nickname will be, will be Abu Abdullah. He will be born in Medina and he will be from the descendants of the Hassan line, not the Hussein line, but the Hassan line. And perhaps Part of his lineage will also be from the uncle of the Prophet and Abbas So the hadith talk about where he was born and his lineage and his name and his nickname. So we're talking about a real person that comes from you know this line of the Prophet. As far as his physical description, the hadith say that he will be tall, dark skin, there will be a light in his face, he will have a hooked nose, curved eyebrows that do not connect. Hair from the middle of his head, rather than from here, the hair will start, it will be bald from the first like, quarter, and his hair will start. Hair, hair from the middle of his head, a mole on his right cheek, a thick beard, and a similar marking in his back, similar to the seal of the Prophet. So this is like, you know, actual description, physical description of what this person will look like. Before the appearance the appearance of this Mahdi, the, the, before the appearance of, of the Mahdi, we said there will be all this tribulation. One of those tribulations is that there will be a character referred to in the Hadith as a Sufyani. And this Sufyani will be essentially a bad guy, and he will come from Damascus slash Syria. And it will be a brutal oppression of those people, that he will kill people, even the hadith, you know, I mean, it's very graphic, uh, 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 killing the 
the wounds of women that are pregnant, you know, things that are very graphic, you know, very gruesome, you know, butcher type of situation. The Sofiani army will come out of Damascus and will try to march towards Medina. And therefore the people of Medina will, will leave Medina frightened. Amongst them will be the Mahdi. So the Mahdi leaves Medina and he goes to Mecca. And the people see him at Mecca and they're like, oh, you're the guy. Then he flees Mecca and he goes to Medina. And then they go to Medina and he says, oh, you're our guy. And he goes back. To, so he's hiding. He doesn't want this role. Right? So somebody that says, oh, you know, I'm the Mahdi. I'm the Mahdi. That's, not, that's not how it works. This guy doesn't want to be the Mahdi. He doesn't want this immense responsibility for the things that we are going to read. And then finally, the ulama of, you know, the main ulama of the Ummah, they will, you know, after all of this back and forth, they'll recognize him, they'll meet him in Mecca, and then that's where they'll make his allegiance. They're like, look, you are the Mahdi, you are the one that the Prophet Sallallahu spoke about, you are from the lineage of the Prophet, والسلام, you know, it's incumbent upon you that you take this bayah, that you take this political allegiance, because you're the only hope that we have against this difficulty, this fitna that we are facing, so the people will give him bayah in Mecca. After this bayah, he will form an army and he will take this army to meet the Sufyani army and he will defeat them. And because of the, the difficulties of warfare and the intenseness, there's a lot of, you know, unfortunately there's a lot of uh, this type of battle and, and conflict and loss of life with, with some of these signs. He will retire to Antioch to rest, which is north of Syria in southern Turkey today, Antioch. And the ulama say the reason that he is called the Mahdi is because when he is in Antioch, he will discover or his people will discover or it will be caused to discover, however you want to phrase it, some sort of artifact that belongs to the original Revelation of Judaism. So whether it's the Ark of the Covenant of uh, Musa السلام, or whether it's part of the Ark of Noah or whether there's an original manuscript of the Torah, something like that. He will find something like that. And the reason he is called the Mahdi, the, the, the Sahaba, some of the Sahaba said is that he will therefore guide the Jewish people to him and that they will believe in this Messiah. So these are shared uh, end of time things because the Jews also believe in a Messiah. I mean, you wouldn't think that we're all going to get along now, but believe it or not, these big faiths, uh, at least the three Abrahamic faiths, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, a lot of these end of time stuff, we believe in the same thing. And this is really super, super, super important for us to understand some of the later things that are going to happen, particularly between Muslims and Jews that are oftentimes misunderstood. So a large part, the hadith say, a large part of the Jewish community will follow the Mahdi. Because they will see, you know, he'd be like pulled out like the original books of Moses or I don't know, the Ark of the Covenant or something that's just sort of undisputable that establishes his legitimacy in a religious point of view. So you can't make this stuff up. You can't, you can't fake and fabricate this. This is something that only Allah can cause to happen. You know, kun fayakun. Na hawla wa la so a large part of the Jewish community will follow the Mahdi. He will head after this towards Constantinople, which is the original name of the city that is currently known as Istanbul. And we know that Constantinople, there are a lot of hadith that talk about Constantinople, about Constantinople falling to Islam, as it did to the, to the Ottoman troops in the medieval times. And Constantinople was the last real remnant of the Roman Empire and that part of the civilization. So it also has that symbolism. The Mahdi will march to Constantinople. The Hadith say that Constantinople will fall to the Mahdi without fighting. It will fall to the Mahdi through his tasbih. So when you read it, it will fall. It's not about an army conflict because you know you can say, well, aren't the Turks Muslims? So yeah, they're Muslims. So then, you know, maybe, and this is, you know, me speaking, maybe it just means that they will accept him because of, you know, his piety, so they will accept him and he will come. Or, you know, God forbid something can happen to, happen to Istanbul or Turkey and he will occupy it, I'm not really sure. But it will fall to the Mahdi, the words of the Hadith, with, through his tasbih. 
You know, that's how he will be accepted. And all along, when he's in Mecca, when he's in Antioch, when he's in Constantinople, he all of these, all of this wealth is coming through his physical presence in these places. So the Hadith talk about the, you know, bringing out the treasures of Mecca. I mean, who knows what that is? Bringing out the treasures of Antioch, bringing out the treasures of Constantinople. And it's that treasure and that wealth that will spread throughout the, the Muslim community. Such that somebody will come and ask and he will give and he says, are you satisfied? And the man will be even embarrassed that he asked in the first place because he says, I'm satiated. That's how the hadith reads. When the man reaches Constantinople, whether it's Constantinople slash Istanbul, whether it means Europe, whether it means, you know, Anatolia. I mean, again, there's a lot of tafsir that can go, but as the hadith say, when he reaches Constantinople, the people in Asham will notify the army of the Mahdi that the Dajjal has appeared. So he will leave Constantinople, he will return to Asham, and he will face off with the Dajjal in Jerusalem. And the fighting between the Mahdi and the Dajjal will be intense. There will be a significant loss of life on the Mahdi side. The Mahdi will not be able to win over the Dajjal. And it is at this time that Christ السلام, returns, is, uh, appears, uh, joins the army of the Mahdi. And when the Dajjal sees Christ, the Prophet وسلم, says he dissolves the way that salt dissolves in the water. Meaning it's not about uh, dunya fighting. Like the, like uh, Christ comes like with like a bazooka or something like that, or like an F-16. That's not what it means. It means that the presence of Christ, السلام, it takes a prophet of God to be able to, de to defeat the Dajjal. And the Dajjal will just disappear, meaning he'll just disappear that way. And then the Mahdi will die, and then you know, the story continues with Christ. So before we get to Christ, السلام, we need to talk about the Dajjal. Most likely we'll talk about Christ next week, the Dajjal. Say the Muhammad وسلم, he said, every single prophet that has been sent has warned their community about the Dajjal. That there is no fitna on earth greater than the fitna of the Dajjal. So this is a serious thing. The Dajjal is a serious problem. The only man disputed is the Dajjal human, is the Dajjal half human, half jinn, is he jinn, whatever. As we read in the hadith, the last lecture of Tamim al Dari, that hadith would indicate that the Dajjal is alive. And uh, I said he's shackled. You know, some of the traditions say that it was Solomon. So they met Ali and they shackled him. I mean, all of these things are weak. But the idea is he will, he will come out. When he comes out, he will appear first in the Persia area. And the Prophet ﷺ said that the Jews of Isfahan will be the first to follow him. But remember that when the Dajjal appears, the Dajjal will call to religion. So the Dajjal's popularity is because he appears to be pious. So he starts off, you know, saying the right stuff, saying the right, quoting the right things, you know, using our language, he's quoting the Hadith, he's quoting the Quran, it looks like he's saying these, you know, you know, big platitudes. He's saying things so people become attracted to him, so they attach themselves to him. When that popularity flares, that's when he starts to switch. He's like, by the way, I'm God. And he starts to claim, you know, this divinity. In the hadith of the Dajjal, the Prophet Sallallahu said that the Dajjal will not appear until 70 people claim they are the Dajjal. So, you know, we've had these Dajjal, you know, but the men he claimed we've had people throughout history who have been these sort of messianic figures that claim their God and, you know, claim this and, and, and claim that. I mean, I don't know how many there are, I didn't enumerate them, but the idea is that many, there will be many false claims. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, every prophet told their people about the Dajjal, but I'm going to tell you something that no other prophet said about the Dajjal, and that's that he has one eye. <coughs> the hadith about the one eye most likely mean that one of his eyes is either weak, small, deficient, hollow, glass eye, something like that. Like when we were kids, you know, they would like draw like a person like with like, you know, like the minion, like with one eye. I don't, I don't think that, I mean, I could be completely wrong, but forgive me if I am, but 
The, the tafsir of these hadith most likely mean that, that there's something wrong with one of his eyes. There's some sort of uh, deformity or uh, medical problem with one of the eyes. And that after he claims divinity, it will appear between his eyes the letter kaf, ra, the root word of kafir, and that every believer, whether they can read or they cannot, or they are illiterate, will be able to read that. But only the believers. So, you know, maybe this, I don't know if, if this is like a tattoo or if this is a marking or it just, it will appear. But the Prophet ﷺ said it's not a function of the script, but if you are a believer, you will be able to see that this is the Dajjal. And by the way, the Prophet ﷺ said, when well, this dude shows up, stay away. Right? So don't, don't think you're going to go and you're going to, you know, I'm going to, with my Sahih Muslim, and I'm going to like defeat the Dajjal. Because you get swallowed up in the fitna of the Dajjal. Why? Because the Dajjal will be given the power of optical illusion. And you will be given the power of manipulating nature. So when you read, for example, he'll bring somebody, and he'll be like, look, who is this? He'll be like, oh my God, that's my mom. He's like, who is this? Oh my God, that's my father. Well, who is this? Oh, that's my grandfather. He'll, he'll show you your whole family. So who knows? Are these... Uh, you know, like the image database that people are, are collecting now, that they'll be able to show you your, your DNA or the DNA samples that people are sending in them. Who knows where that stuff goes, right? But the Dajjal will be able to manipulate that kind of stuff. You'll have access to that sort of database, and you'll be able to show you your family. You'll, you'll be totally weirded out if you just see, like, your whole history of your family, meaning people that have passed away in front of you. So this is why it's called a fitna. So you will think that that's real. Just like the sorcerers in the story of Moses, uh, they they tricked the people with the, the mercury and the sun and they made the staff look like it was the snake and all that kind of stuff. That stuff happens. Right? So you don't want to be, we don't want to be there when that happens. He will he will point to the sky and he will say rain and it will rain. He'll, he'll point to the earth and he'll say grow and things will grow. So you'll be able to manipulate nature. You'll have some sort of capacity to be able to do that. The Prophet says, if you meet him, he'll show you two rivers. One river will look like fire and one river will look like sweet water. Close your eyes and drink from the water. It looks like fire because it truly is sweet water. So everything will be opposite. He'll be duplicitous and opposite and not honest and not true. That's why he's called the Dajjal. And the, remember this, that the fitna of the Dajjal is so great that it will take a prophet to defeat him. But the Prophet ﷺ told us that we can protect ourselves from the Dajjal by the first 10 verses of Surah Al-Kahf. So the Prophet didn't leave us without advice of how to protect ourselves from this kind of thing. So he will have all of this like magic, uh, optical illusion, like David Copperfield type, type of stuff. Right? People will just be totally like, will not be able to, oh my God, he must be true. He can point, you know, things happen. The Prophet he says that he will come, one day will be like 40 days, one day will be like a year, one day will be like a month, one day will be like a week. If you add that up, it would seem to indicate that the entire presence of the Dajjal will be 14 months. Now the day as a year, that hadith, you know, whether like the sun doesn't set or whether the fitness is so intense, it will feel like a year, whatever the case may be. The Sahaba asked the Prophet, this is just a little bit of an aside, but this is important, so we understand how our deen works. The Prophet asked, and the Sahaba asked the Prophet, they said, in the day that's like a year, do we only pray five times? And the Prophet, he said, no, you have to calculate the timings of the prayer. And the reason this hadith is so important from a fiqh point of view is it teaches us how do we calculate prayer times, fasting times, our liturgical day, and our liturgical life when the when the moon and the sun no longer function normally. And it is this hadith that we use to answer questions for people that are like in northern latitudes, you know, people that are in Sweden, Denmark, Norway. How do you fast when the sun doesn't set? How do you pray Aisha when there's no actual method, you know, things like that? This hadith becomes very significant because the Prophet told us there could be a time where the the, the normal functioning of the stars, uh, of the moon and the sun, no longer function the way they are for our deen purposes. So that's just a little bit of a, of a tangent. Uh,
Another interesting part of the Dajjal is that one person will emerge to challenge the Dajjal. And he'll say, I know you. You're the liar that the Prophet ﷺ told us about. So the Dajjal will kill him and bring him back. And he says, what do you say about me now? He says, I only believe in what I said even more. You are the person, you are the liar that the Prophet ﷺ told us about. And uh, the hadith, the, the, the ulama that talked about the hadith, they said that this is the khidr, alayhi salam. And then in one narration, he actually he kills him. And they say that this will be the only fatality until the meeting of the army with the Mahdi, meaning that the Dajjal's fitna will not be the fitna of loss of life, but God forbid the fitna of the Dajjal will be loss of your religion. That if you see the Dajjal, you will be consumed by that magic, by that charisma, by that illusion, that you will, you will believe in the Dajjal and you will not believe in, in your faith anymore. That's the great fitna. So there's that story about the Khidr. I, I think in uh, one of the previous lectures, somebody had asked about the Khidr. And this is one of the things that he, uh, where he appears. Lastly, just to round out the conversation, uh, prophetic advice. You know, what did the Prophet Sassam tell us about? So, so far, we're just getting into all the, 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 the big stuff. The Prophet Sassam told us not to fight the Dajjal. Not to approach the Dajjal, but to stay away from the fitna. And that when the Mahdi appears, that will be the person that will face the Dajjal, and it will be Christ, alayhi salam, the one who actually defeats him ultimately. The Prophet Sassam told us that everyone that comes in the Dajjal's way is tricked, which is why he has that initial following. Why did the Prophet Sassam specifically say the Jews of Isfahan? It could be because the Jews are, as I said earlier, are also awaiting the Messiah. And he might say, maybe he, maybe he's he's talking Torah and Talmud. So the Jews of Isfahan say, oh, this is our guy. So they follow him. So it doesn't necessarily mean that those people are bad, but that's how great this fitna is. So if that appears, we don't want to be there. He will be. He will claim divinity. That's one of the signs of the Dajjal. And the Prophet Sassam, he said he will enter every home. And of course, now we understand sort of what that means with communication and technology, and internet, things like that. In the pre-modern period, this was unknown. What does that mean he will enter every home? But the Prophet Sassam said that he will not be able to enter Mecca and Medina. So those two cities are safe. And that is why ultimately the Mahdi appears from Medina, because he appears from one of the cities that is safe. So the fight between the Mahdi and the Dajjal will kind of be like a stalemate until the return of Christ. And that's where we will pick up next time. Wallahu ta'ala ala wa Hope everyone's okay. Any questions? Do we know how long between when Sayyidina Mahdi will appear and Sayyidina Isa appears? The hadith that talk about the Mahdi's rule say that his rule will be like seven years, eight years, or nine years. But then the ulama say that most likely that means the good part of his of his rule. So uh, he will appear when he's 40 years old. But probably it will be like something like two decades to accomplish all this. I mean, it could be wrong. It could be actually just be seven years. But in the midst of the, of the Mahdi's Appearance, life, and rule will be the appearance of the Dajjal. It seems like the Dajjal's, his fitna will be so big, but his actual earth time won't be that long. But the fitna will just be so great that, you know, it will be like, it feels like it's forever, one of those situations. Christ, alayhi salam, will come and he will rule for 40 years after the man. And we'll talk about that next week, but you know, the Sahaba, they believed in this stuff so much that Abu Huraira, anhu, when he narrated the hadith of, the, of, of Christ coming back, he told the people around him, he said, if you see him, please say Abu Huraira says salam on him. That's how much he believed that this was truth for them. This is not like a, you know, some fantasy. And the Prophet Sassim himself, he says in one of the narrations, and if you see him, give him my salam. Christ, alayhi salam. Stuff is going to happen. Like all the other stuff we've talked about has happened, 98% of these things have happened. Why, why would these last three, four things not happen? This stuff is going to happen. Now, we don't know exactly how it's ha going to happen or how it's going to look. We're trying to do the best we can with the, with, the, with, the, with the narrations that we have. 
but this stuff is pretty explicit. Uh, and, you know, I love protectives from the fitna. Is this the Jaya person or a system? The Jaya is a person. Yeah, he's a human being, he's bow-legged, and he has frizzy hair. Which I forgot to mention that. There's a person. Will the Fitna affect um, people who also passed away? No. It'll be safe, I guess. It'll be a Fitna for the people that he interacts with. You know, basically between the you know Azerbaijan and the Sham area really and, and the Hejaz seems like that. But but his his fitna will enter every house, so I think everyone will know about him. So maybe there will be people that will follow him from all over the place, but it's not gonna be like the people that are there. So it's for those that are alive. Yeah. Both so it's interesting both of the job and the maybe both have a Jewish following at some point. Yeah, isn't that, isn't that weird? And so is it safe to assume that then when the Mehdi finds Sardafak and, and the Jews sort of like flock to him, but, but he's gonna he's gonna be Muslim, right? Yes. And, and so the Mahdi is is going to be, I mean obviously we believe that the Mahdi will be Muslim. In, in other words, he will follow the Sharia of the of Prophet Muhammad, but he will also be it's like following Abu Bakr or Omar. I mean he's he just he's gonna tell you what to do. So we don't have to say, oh, but you know, I grew up in Sunday school, they taught me, he's like, you don't have to do that anymore. He's gonna tell you this is the right answer. So the proof that he's going to have is going to be beyond what he's gonna be like a living interpreter of the religion. So then those Jews will not all of them, but yes, many of the many Jews will, will follow. And they'll basically convert to Islam or let's just say they'll follow. They'll follow. Just, you know, so we don't get into these like silos. Because there'll be Muslims that will lose their way with the the jet. So they'll, they'll follow the Mahdi, yes. Yeah. So in the later hadith that talk about the tree saying, oh, Muslim, come with a Jew behind me and kill him, you know, those that hadith that, that everyone likes to talk about, that Islamophobes like to talk about. Actually, if you look at all the narrations of that hadith, the other narrations say, oh, Muslim, there's a disbeliever behind me, come and fight him. So that's talking about people that are not going to follow the Mahdi, the people that are going to be on the Dajjal side. Not like it's not like Islam versus Jews at all. It's think of it, it's the Mahdi versus the Dajjal. So whose side are you on? Yeah, there will be people on the Dajjal side, they're not gonna make it. Whether they're Jews, Muslims, the Prophet said that 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 a third of the army of the Mahdi will perish in the fitna of the Dajjal, and they are the worst of humanity. So that's bad. But those are from us, you know, God forbid. So it's not Islam versus Judaism. It's the Dajjal versus the Mahdi. That's how we have to think about it. Especially because in this culture, when, when people pull that stuff out, we need to be able to answer, you know, because it sounds really horrific when you, oh, you have you're this tradition that the tree is going to tell you the Jews behind the kill. Well, I mean, that's way out of context. That's not really not what that tradition means. So I think that the Jew, there will be a large following of Jews. Not all of them, but there will be of the Messiah. How the Christianity sees the Dajjal? Do they have any hope of Dajjal? I think there's an Antichrist in Christianity. I've seen the, the rabbi on Falls Road, when the Messiah thing came out on Netflix, yes. he, we were messaging back and forth, and he was asking me, like, what does Islam say about the Messiah? So we were thinking about putting together like a like a lecture uh, for to talk about these issues from you know, the three Abrahamic faiths. I mean, I'm, I was a little hesitant. I mean, I can see how that can get like into a bunch of like, um, they do. They they do have the same. They have an antichrist, but I don't know if it's as well defined as the, as in Judaism, because in in Judaism there's the Talmud. There's multiple Talmuds. In, in Christianity, it's really just the Gospels, and I don't know if just sort of handed down things. Hey, is there Damascus involved in this whole scenario? Some Syria. Yeah. The. Uh, that Sofiani army situation will come from Damascus. Okay. I thought I read somewhere where uh, that's another place where Muslims flee to. No? Is that incorrect? Uh, I think during the fitna of the Dajjal, because the Dajjal will, will come from Persia area to Jerusalem. Okay. 
So maybe Mecca, Medina, Jerusalem is a uh, Mecca, Medina, Damascus is a place to flee to. And then ultimately, uh, Christ will defeat the Dajjal in Bab Lud, which is in current Israeli town. Lod, or I think it's called. Well, I mean, I'll get that information next time. Army side. Right. <clears throat> What's on that? What? Because army side, the line of death. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Does the the job? Does he? Um, does he kill the man, or is there a dread? No, no. He will not. He will not kill. He will not. It seems like he doesn't have that kind of power. It's just more like illusion power, but his. Like the defeat of him, it's not easy to get rid of him. It's the appearance of Christ that causes him. So Christ will be in the Mahdi's army, and the Jed will die or whatever end, and then the Mahdi will die a normal death. And then Christ will pick up where the Mahdi left off, and then he will be he will rule for 40 years amongst the you know in that area. And he ultimately will die. He will he will marry, and he will die, and he will be buried next to the Prophet Sallallahu in Medina. So in the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu there's a fourth empty grave that the Sahaba left because of all of these hadith. So that's where Christ ultimately will be buried. What will happen to the follower of the child? Will they I think that he's going to die in all the, in all this conflict. They're not going to last. But after Christ, alayhi salam, you know, things don't get better. Things get worse until Yom al Qiyam. So Christ is going to be like the end of the good times, in a way. There will always be a pocket of believers because the Prophet وسلم, he, he said in many hadith, and this hadith itself is mutawatir, la yazalu ta'ifa min ummati. There will always be a group of my ummah that will be standing for truth until Yom Qiyam. But if you put all of that stuff together, most likely it means that the believers will be very, very, very few. They'll just be like an isolated group of people. And that after the passing of Ma'isa, things will get progressively worse. Morality will be worse. People will be worse. Religion will be lost. The Kaaba will be destroyed. The Mus'haf will be raised. No one will know how to worship God, and it's at that time that the hour will come. So there, there will be followers of Dajjal from the point of view of that there will be Dajjalic people after the, the, the Christ. But specifically, the fit of the Dajjal will end when he, when he dies, when he's defeated. Um, how is the Dajjal going like, to get around? You probably fly around, I guess. Facebook. Facebook, yeah. I think about all of this stuff, right? All of this technology. I mean, the Prophet saw something when he said that all these years ago, no one understood, but they believed it. Now we, you know, we can see. I was thinking about that hadith of he will show you your parents and your grandparents. And you'll think about all of that DNA stuff that people are collecting and all the images that people have access to uh, now, the database of images that exist. Uh, it's very conceivable how this stuff can happen. How we can manip these things can be manipulated. Didn't they just grow lettuce in like the space shuttle or something? Right? Yeah. yeah. Now they're growing food. So when you talk about manipulating nature, he points and he says grow. Okay, well I mean I, we can understand that. It doesn't mean he's going to point and then something's going to come up. It means that he's going to be able to manipulate growth, he's going to be able to manipulate or simulate rainfall. So, yeah, we can all understand how that stuff can happen. Also holograms, like holograms, too. Yeah. Some of that stuff is freaky. The holograms. Robots. Virtual reality. Virtual reality. The Cylons. Everyone understands that cultural reference. Only a few people get that. It's serious, man. I'm lying. This stuff is going to happen. And we're going to say, Salaqa Rasulullah, we're not going to get lost. We're going to know how we're going to, you know, it's okay, we calm down, calm down. Let's recite the first 10 verses of Surah Al Kahf, and inshallah, it will pass. But if you don't have this teaching, you're going to freak out. When you see somebody that can do all that stuff, you'll freak out. You're like Elon Musk on steroids or something. 
You do all of these things. You gotta like this is the Messiah. I'm gonna worship this guy. Cult of personality, right? So you just you worship this. You just follow this person. And then you know, Isa is gonna give it to the, to the, the he's gonna dissolve the way that salt dissolves in water. All of those the, when we talk about the Juj and Majuj that will appear at the end of Christ's time. How does how do we get rid of Yajuj and Majuj? Christ makes dua and then Allah causes them to die and then their their bodies stink. So Allah take causes a, a wind to come, they have the carcasses are carried into the ocean and then it rains and then the earth is clean. There's no like epic end of, you know, Christ has like all of these Bradley tanks and he's like destroying the world. It's not like that. It's all passive. It's all from divine intervention. Christ will make dua and yeah, Juj and Juj will be rid of that fitna. How do we kill the Dajjal? Christ will appear. So when you see this beauty, you know, Christ will descend as if his hair is dripping oil. He will look fresh and beautiful. I mean, can you imagine seeing Christ, Isaiah, who has the, some of the, the beauty of the of Sayyidina Muhammad, Isaiah, I mean, that's truth, right? The Christians, they say, uh, God painted the word and the word became flesh. I mean, we don't necessarily believe it like that, but I mean, Christ is huge. It's going to be all of this nur. So when, when the Dajjal sees it, he can't do that Copperfield stuff on him. It's not going to work. And that's why he's going to dissolve, meaning he's just going to, you know, I don't know, just run away or collapse or have a heart attack because he, the, the charade is going to be up. So all of the end of life stuff, other than the Mahdi actually having an army fighting the Sufiani guy and that kind of situation, a lot of it's just really passive. And that's the, the importance of studying this stuff is that we don't do what ISIS and these people are doing, which is try to simulate and recreate and force these things to happen. When you do that, you get bloodshed, like the Johaiman guy in, in the late 70s that, that did the Haram attack. You know, there was they killed people in the Haram. That's serious. That's a grave, grave, that's a grave sin upon a grave sin. All of that started with this like hallucination, oh, I'm the Mahdi. I had a dream that I'm the Mahdi. And that the woman he marries, she said, I dreamt when I was a teenager that I'm gonna marry the Mahdi. You see how the fitna work, how shaitan works. How he paves the way for these things. So everyone now believes that this dude is the Mahdi. So yeah, I'll follow the Mahdi. So they go and then, but look what they ended up doing. It doesn't work like that. All the stuff that we're studying, the Kitab and Sunnah, that's not how it's going to work. It's going to appear when Allah wants it to appear. And when Allah wants it to appear, we will see those signs and we will be able to, you know, rationally follow them. Yes. Um, is it like born or like you know, he's born. So he's most the, the majority of the Alim say he's a human being. So yeah. Yeah. Of course, if he was born, he had parents. Does he have supernatural power or is it all just smoke and mirrors? It's all smoke and mirrors. All smoke and mirrors. So in the hadith about he will kill <coughs> this person. Literally says he will cut them in half and then put them back together. And then the ulama the comment on the hadith, meaning not physically, but he will be able to simulate that people will see that that's what happened. You know, like you know, when I'm going to put the person in the box and cut them in half, and oh, and then like oh, Vicky shows up again, you know, like in a bikini. It's going to be like that. That's all illusion. So it's the same thing. It's not. It's not that he's going to have supernatural power. It's he's going to be able to manipulate stuff. Just like the guy in the show, the Netflix show. Did you see it? I got no, I got one. Who saw it? You guys saw the manipulation, right? The walking on the water. Same thing. I'm, I'm so, I mean, look. Now they're talking about it. Now people are who? I, who, I want to know who wrote this. Which show? Which show? The Messiah. Uh, okay. <laughs> Yeah. It seems that he will he will be of a specific religion, or he will call to a he will he will call people to him using religion. 
whether it's Islam or Judaism, I mean, that's, I said maybe he will say some smart things in using Jewish symbolism, so that's why the Jews of Persia will follow him when he appears. I, I mean, I, I could be making that up. But the fitna of the Dajjal is that when he first appears, he will seem like a pious person. So whether that that's whether he uses Islam or another religion or a combination of religions, Allah Alam. But yes, for sure he will. That's how he gains his popularity. So he gains deep popularity by claiming religion. All people in Islamic history that ever claim they're the Mahdi or ever claim that they're on the Haq, they were all pious people. The guy that stormed Mecca, he was pious. The ISIS people, they all memorized the Quran. And the Prophet Sassam told us that. He said, when you look at the Khawarij and you compare your prayer to their prayer, you will think you've never prayed. When you compare your fasting to their fasting, you will think you've never fasted. Meaning that all they do is pray and they fast. Meaning they're pious. But what did the Prophet Sassam say about them? The Quran doesn't go past their throats. It doesn't penetrate their hearts. All of the Khawarij, even at the time of Imam Ali, alayhi salam, they were all pious people. They were Abed and they were Zuhair, they had no dunya, they wore like the same tunic, they were simple, and that's what gave them their street cred. So religion gives people the street cred. And then the ulama that are doing really God's work, you know, people online, they say, oh look, these are the ulama of the Sultan. They go to these fancy conferences. That's what they say. Look, read those comments. When people say, oh, they go to these fancy conferences and in these fancy hotels or, you know, I, I didn't make the conference. I just got invited. Why shouldn't I go? But they'll say, oh, these are the ulama of the Sultan. He's not a real Muslim. If he was a real Muslim, he would be a Zahid. You know, you'd only have one, one tunic or something like that. So the man, he will come out looking like that. He will come out looking the part, saying the right things, looking very simple. Oh, I only want good. I really want to bring people together in love. We start saying all these one-liners that are very hard to uh, fight. But then as he gets his following and he can do all this manipulation, he said, but you know, I'm divine. That's where that fitness is. Because that's not the way of, of the of the MBA. That's not what the Prophet told us. But the giant is going to take that peace Yes, eventually, but not in the beginning. In the beginning, you know, who knows? He might he might be leading people in Tarawih or something like that. People are like crying, like having heart attacks because of his du'a in the mosque. That's why it's a fitna. Because now we're gonna people are gonna show us all of these videos. Look, I, I got this video from the phone of like the first Tarawih in the the Dajjal, the, whatever this guy, the judge's name is leading the prayer, and people are like fainting. Look. Uh, this group woman is going to come and he made dua for my child and my child had leukemia and the child has been cured from his dua. Allahu Akbar! And people are going to follow and follow and follow. And then when he gets that following, then he will switch. He said, like, oh, but I'm, I'm divine. I'm the one that, that, that caused this because I'm divine. And that's where the fitna is. But what do we say when something happens? We say, Alhamdulillah. Or when we have a difficult la hawla wa quwwata illa billah inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. That's our way. He's not going to talk like that, so he's going to trick people. So you have to look out for for people that look pious. You have to look out. There's a difference between deen and tadayun. There's a difference between religion and religiosity. Religion, deen. This is what we're doing here. This is the study of religion. Tadayun is personal religiosity. That's never ending. You can you can pray as many rakahs as you want, fast as many days as you want. Give all of your chair of money to sadaqah, you know, live begging in the streets, you can be super pious. But that piety is not knowledge of religion. It's not deen. There's a huge difference. The people that will lead us like the Mahdi, the Prophet ﷺ said, he will have my name and he will follow my sunnah. Meaning he will be an alim, he will be a mujtahid, he will be a, a, a jurist of the highest caliber as well as a political leader. Like Sayyidina Abu Bakr. If Sayyidina Abu Bakr told you to do something, you wouldn't question, you just do it. <coughs> Sorry. So, like Muslims getting tricked by the job before the Kafir war. It's, they see that before he claims the Benedictines. How is that? How are they looked at? I mean, as disbelief? I mean, like. Yeah. I don't know. We have a weak, weak faith. Allah protect us. 
But you see, he's aided like with these optical illusion things. So it's yeah, no, I'm just it's kind of a like scary proposition. Have you ever seen like the guy that uh, like moves his like legs, yeah. like his waist? Oh, you've never seen those YouTube videos? Like, he like yeah. shows up behind a tree and then, like he lo it looks like he like right. severed his yeah. body. Yeah. yeah, that stuff is freaky. Yeah. Have you ever seen people's reaction? Yeah, they they freak out. Like some people like run away right? because it's, it's an optical illusion. It's gonna be like that. So like when you when you see it, you're, you're not gonna be able to deny your instinct reaction. That's why the Prophet Hassan referred to as a fit. Yeah, no, I, I'm just saying that it's a scary proposition to be uh to be caught up with the, for a Muslim to be at the beginning, let's say, be, yeah, and they're tricked. You know, let's say even if they have this strong faith, they trick before he claims divinity, right? Let's say I'm one of those guys. Well, you're not gonna you know? <laughs> Let's say I'm one of those guys, and I'm tricked before he claims divinity, but I'm, well, too, I'm too late, it's caught, I'm caught up with this guy. So how do we not get tricked? There is one way that Islam has been passed on every generation, it's the way that we have here. So you, you can come and you can ask me, where did I get this information from? Who taught me? Who authorized me to sit in this chair and teach? And I'll tell you. And you can go ask them. And they'll give you the same answers. But all these one-hit wonders, who are these people? Where, where do they get their knowledge from? Where is their lineage? Where is their backing? Who authorized them? These people have their one-hit wonders. Not just the Dajjal, but all the people that are in the line of the like all of the Khawarij. <clears throat> ask those, those ISIS people, where did you, who... You know, who taught you this? They just made it up. That's how we protect ourselves. We protect ourselves by being part of the tradition, by passing all of this stuff on. The way, the way I got it, I, I received it, so I give, inshallah. And then you guys will take it and you will give, and so on and so forth. And that's the way we're protected. But when you find a one hit wonder, especially people that are very, very uh, good at speaking, public speaking. That are quick on their feet. I'm not saying that if you have to be a mumbling idiot to be a scholar, but I'm saying what the signs of the Hawarij that they are personally pious, a lot of uh, personal piety and zuhd. They're like ascetic, you know. No, no, no. I don't. I don't want anything. Alhamdulillah. I'm good. I'm fasting actually today. You know? Like they go to somewhere to give a lecture and they're like, oh, come and have lunch. Like, I'm actually fasting. Oh, subhanAllah, it's fasting. You know, right? They have a lot of personal piety. They're, they speak. They speak well. They use broad things, platitudes, not deep. They have no lineage. They have no uh, teaching, uh, religious lineage. They have. They can't tell you where they got this information. All of those things are the red flags. They make it seem that they're right and everyone else is wrong, right? Rather than the plurality that Islam has. That's the stuff that you know you know run for the hills to find that kind of person. And we are surrounded by those people today. They're not necessarily calling to disbelieve the way that the Dajjal is, but they're definitely taking us away from the straight path. Yeah. Gonna, You're gonna be fine, man. Don't worry. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Don't be scared. <laughs> um, to add to um, the answer to Brother's question, I guess that's where the recommendation to recite uh, or the first two verses um, come into play to perhaps also protect us from being in the gathering of the Dajjal before we become the Dajjal. Sure. Yeah. Can you kill the Dajjal? No. Okay. Not even the Mahdi can. The Mahdi will be at a stalemate until Christ والسلام, descends from the heavens. And then he not he won't even kill the Dajjal. Just the mere presence of Christ will cause the Dajjal to perish. And that's why it's a great, great fit and great tribulation. It's not like he's the enemy, we're gonna like seek him and root him out. It's not like that. He's a different kind of enemy. He's also people that are pressuring on people. What do you mean, force? No, it's, it, it, it's not about, it's, he's just going to trick people so people will believe in him. So the Prophet said the fitna is if you believe in him that he is true. 
He's not even looking for followers. He's just going to do this stuff. So when people see this stuff, they'll be like, oh my God, look. Right? All of the social media platforms will instantly give him a verified page. Look at this guy. <laughs> he can grow, you know, chicken out of the water, thin air. He can tell you from your blood sample, uh, all of your family, show you all of your lineage from the time of beginning of time. He's going to be that kind of fitness. He's not necessarily calling to himself, but his appearance will make people believe in him. The Prophet said, You lose if you believe in him. Because to believe in him is to disbelieve in that Allah Muhammad. It's as simple as that. You don't even have to follow him. That's why when the Prophet said, The fitna will enter every home. You know, you could be here, you know, God forbid, and be a dajelic, you know, because you're like constantly looking at these videos. Yeah, I'm going to buy his new air to chicken machine so I can create chicken too out of thin air. You know, whatever. I don't know. I'm just making this stuff up. But you understand it's, you, people are going to buy into that gimmick. That's the thing. They're not going to coerce you to believe. Exactly. For me, that's the challenge. How do you, you see something like what's happening right now? You know that there's fitna in it. So you try to step away. But the challenge is really stepping away, recognizing that it's Because the, the, the people that get caught up in the fitna, they are following their nefs. It feels good to be part of the fitna. Just like something happens and you get together with your friends and did you hear what happened to so and so? Oh my God, dude, can you believe she did that? Like you feel good talking about it. Now extrapolate that on a big scale and that's what people are, are doing now. They actually believe. People, Muslims actually, there are Muslims right now that are gathering in homes, reciting the whole Quran, so that Bernie Sanders wins. I swear there are people right now in this country, people that you probably know that are doing that. That's what the fitna is. Do you think that's the fitna? The Prophet hasn't told us not to put the deen into that kind of stuff. You want to get involved in politics for whatever reason, get involved, but leave the deen away because the deen is superior to politics. The religion is above the republic. It's not subservient. It, it serves the republic, but it's above the republic of identity <laughs> point of view. As far as partisan politics, there is no space for religion in that. That's like us arguing about like the expansion of the mosque. I don't get involved in that stuff. There's no halal or haram answer at all. It's whatever the board thinks is the best thing for the mosque, given the constraints that we have. Why, why should I have an opinion about that? It's the same thing. Why should the religion have an opinion of which candidate? So the fitna makes yourself feel good. What's hard is to stay with yourself and be the best version of yourself. That's what's hard. Because we're so scared to be alone and to work on ourselves, the next occupies us, the lower next occupies us with all that other stuff. And at the end of the day, Bernie's going to lose bad. And it's going to be Sleepy Joe against, you know, the Teflon Don, and he's going to win, and, and he's just, life is going to go on and on and on. And really, they're the, same, they're the same coin, two sides of the same coin. And then all of this, people cursing each other, you know, vote for Abu Bernie. All that garbage, all of that's going to go as if it was nothing. The way that the jail will vanish, like the salt that dissolves in the water, all that stuff will dissolve. That's what the fitna is. What's not fitna is the stuff that remains. The stuff that's really deep-rooted in principles, for us deep-rooted in the principles of our faith, that's the stuff that remains. And that's the stuff that if we want to be safe, we have to hold ourselves to. If we practice that now, and we teach that to our children, and as a community we are like that, inshallah, you know, Allah protect us, our descendants, we pass that on, they're not going to be caught up in the fitna of the Dajjal, because they're, they're going to have a nervous reaction to fitna. Like, that's not Islam. I know that's not Islam, because when I was growing up, the sheikh of the mosque told us that that's not right. 
the Sheikh of the mosque worked like everybody else. The Sheikh of the mosque, you know, did. They're going to remember that the person that taught them the religion also passed on the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they're not going to be deluded by, you know, some guy pointing, manipulating the rain and stuff like that. So it's very important that what you said is exactly, I mean, you stated it better than I did. The, the, the goal of all of this is one, we need to know it because it's part of our religion. But two is we need to practice not getting involved in the fitna. <coughs> You said that um, there's going to be people that claim the, the job, or I know people claim the. I read about people claiming the name. Well, they won't claim the the, the the gem, but they will be the gems, like people that will emerge out of piety and claim that they are divine. Oh, because it'd be kind of weird to say him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not not like people that claim they're the man. Yeah. So they're not like, by the way, because I mean, that's a bad thing. But there will be the gems, plural, oh, okay. meaning people that emerge from piety and. Like who who knows Farid Muhammad, the guy that taught Elijah Muhammad, he declared he 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 said that he was divine, right? That's a dajjal, somebody that claimed divinity. Um, you know, and and you can extrapolate from that some of the uh, like the assassins or the hashashin, like that group, that sect that emerged, or the found or the people that that started the Druze sect. They also started because of some some Khalifa, Fatim Khalifa. Either the Fatim Khalifa himself claimed he was div divine, or the followers of that Khalifa claimed he was divine. Mm -hmm. So that's a, sort of what we would refer to as claim uh, the genetic figures in Islamic history. False. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Not like the Jen, the, the capital letter. Yeah. Um, in the show, the, the Messiah, they speak about the future so these are the big signs. The, the gen comes and we're there. We're like, it's end game. We're already pretty much at the end. But if that stuff happens, I mean, that's we're really at the end. So all of these now are the major signs. Were you here last week? Okay, so there are three types of signs of Yom Al-Qiyam. There are the small signs, the middle signs, and the large signs. The small signs are all the things that happened during the time of the Sahaba. They happened in the first hundred years of Islam. The middle signs are everything that came from that time and continue till now, and they are largely moral vices. The women will stop wearing hijab, people will drink alcohol, fornication will be uh, prevalent, riba will be prevalent, etc. There will be moral vices that emerge and continue. And then there are the large signs. The large signs, they have their, themselves three parts, the introduction, Middle and end. The introduction we did last week is the hadith of Tamim al dari as narrated in Sahih Muslim. Tamim al dari was a, a Christian Arab before Islam. He was a fisherman. He was lost on a boat for a month. Anyway, he met the Dajjal on this island. The Dajjal asked him three questions. He said, is there still dates in the city of Baisan? Is there still water in Lake Tiberias? And is there still water in the Dead Sea? When there is no more dates in the states, uh, dates of Baisan, which there are no more date trees in, in Baisan, it's now an Israeli city, the Dead Sea is reducing its water rapidly, and so is Lake Tiberias. The Dajjal said, at that time, Allah has given me permission to come out. So those three things are the, inch. now we are, those three things have already happened. Now what are the middle, the middle part of the large signs of what we're talking about? The Mahdi, the Dajjal, Christ, Ya'juj, and Ma'juj. These four are the only ones that we know the order of because they all relate to each other. The other signs we don't know the order of. Uh, the, the earthquake in the east and the west and the Arabian Peninsula, the destruction of the Kaaba, the raising of the Mus'haf, uh, the Debba, uh, the fire, and the sun rising from the west and setting in the east. When the sun rises in the west and sets in the east, there is no more tawbah. And there is no more pious action. Allah has closed the scales. Meaning, I'm a Muslim, I prayed five times a day and I never pray the sunnah. I wake up and I see that the sun rose in the west. Oh my God, I'm freaking out. I'm going to pray all of the sunnahs. The sunnahs don't count. Only what I used to do before. There's no more tawbah. That's the end of the middle period. The middle side. The end stuff, halas, we're all going to die and we'll all be resurrected and then the stuff will be on the clear. That's a summary of everything. Got it?
Yeah. We don't have to come anymore. That's what we're going to say. <laughs> yeah. Last one because I think, uh, okay, two more. Go ahead. Okay. So when the Dajjal come and, like, you kind of expose him that he's a Dajjal, will he try to kill you or, like, torture you? No, he'll try to trick you. Okay. And if you know the first ten ayahs of Surah Al-Kahf, you will be protected from that. Okay. So Anas can teach you the the first ten years. Yeah, sister. Um, so the dark signs already happened. Started happening a few years ago, right? Well, I mean, since 1950, yes. And so the question is, uh, um, following up on what you asked, how it says before. Sorry, but wait. Does it mean that the jet is uh, man is coming next week? <laughs> it, took, it took 70 years for those three things in that hadith to manifest. The, the, the jet, might, uh, the man might not appear for like 200 years. There's no waiting, and there's no trying to guess when this is going to happen. And anybody tells you that they know when this is going to happen, they, they don't know. No one knows, or else the Prophet saw something have told us. So what I'm saying is that the introduction to the large signs have already appeared. That means what's left. What's left is for the stuff that we're talking about. There's nothing else is going to happen until that stuff happens. When is this going to happen? Allah, Allah maybe 500 years from now. But we're already in that stage of the major signs. Sorry to cut you off. Go ahead. What was your sec second question? Second question was yeah, we should make dua. One of the Sahaba, I believe it was the Sahaba or one of the holy men, he said, if I had one dua that was going to be answered, that I knew was going to be answered, I would make it for the ruler. That's how important it is for our day to day life that the ruler and our political system is good. We have an obligation, we have an Islamic obligation to pray for our republic. Because Islam can only be through some type of political system. Imam al-Mawardi, he says, when you have a place to pray and you have the ability to, to marry based on the sharia and you have your you can have your meat or chicken prepared, Islam, your food prepared Islamically, that's Dar al-Islam even if you live in a non-Muslim country. So our Islam, our ability to do, to do this is a direct function of the peace of, the, of our republic. But that's very, very different than me making dua and to hedge it for Bernie Sanders to win. Because how do I know that that's what's good? Why don't I just pray for the republic? That's putting religion in partisan politics. So does that mean that Mike Bloomberg is bad? Does that mean that Trump is bad? Well, why they're all bad from that point of view, morally. <laughs> Honestly, they all suck. Don't be deluded by what people are saying. Don't be tricked. Politics is a very, very dirty business. So rather than what my point was, we should pray for the republic. And I you know every 4th of July, I give a very patriotic, you know, khutbah, and I'm working on lyrics to the battle hymn of the republic, Islamic lyrics for the battle hymn of the republic, and very patriotic. We should be on 4th of July, the American flag is up. This is our home. This is our republic. This is our constitution. This is our country. But that's it as far as Islam and politics. Anything below that, politics with a, a lowercase p, there is no religion. Not just Islam. Don't put Christianity in that. Don't put Judaism in that. All of those imams, in the name of being an imam, that are standing at those political rallies, Allah is going to ask them about that yom al -qiyamah. That's haram. It's not just haram for me. It's haram for the, the pastor across the street. It's haram for the rabbi. The rabbi down the, the street here, Stuart, he goes to all of these political uh, rallies, and I tell all of the, the, the Jewish other people that I, the rabbis I meet that I, I, I find that offensive. Because he is pushing his congregation to vote for a certain candidate in the name of religion. And therefore, religion is used to be a divisive force in the community. I have I cannot do that. I'm not allowed to do that as a religious leader. But the, the mosque, the church, the synagogue, the temple is for everybody that wants to come and worship. My job is to help facilitate the religious experience, answer people's questions. But to put religion in partisan politics will be the end of Islam. 
The Prophet ﷺ said, you will follow the ways of the Jews and the Christians even into the lizard hole. I understand that hadith to be exactly this issue. All of these imams changing their, their, their profile picture to Amr Burni and all of this, this is garbage, this is nonsense. Islam is free and innocent from those claims. And I can't be, I, I, I can't find the words to be even more adamant about this point. This is extremely dangerous, not just for Islam, but it's extremely dangerous for Christians, it's extremely dangerous for Hindus, it's extremely dangerous for Jews in this country to use their religion to force and, and influence their people to vote a certain way. This is haram. And, and it's fundamentally un-American. This is not what the principles of this country were standing or founded upon. I will say this until you guys put me in the grave. Probably when you put me, I'll be one more thing. <laughs> and I'll remind you of the republic and that's it. I'm serious. This is serious stuff. And I know some of you don't like it when I say this. So if you don't, don't ask. Because I'm not. I'm just going to ramp it up even more and more and more. Sorry. اللهم صل أفضل صلاة على أسعد مخلوقاتك سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم عدد معلوماتك ومداد كلماتك كلما ذكرك الذاكرون وغفل عن ذكره الغافلون